Good afternoon. I finally got that right, and welcome to our, our midweek service. I think this will be the last one before we hit Christmas, because in a fortnight's time, the Guild are having their carol afternoon. But I am told anybody who is not of the Guild who would like to join them for that um, in a fortnight's time will be made more than welcome. Um, so please, if you, if, you, if you want to go along to that, then let them know and they'll welcome you. It, it's, a, it's strange how in one year you forget how far we've come. As we sit here, perhaps uncomfortable in our masks and wishing they were gone, I was looking back at what we had done last year. We could barely meet and we couldn't think. And it's funny when you think back on it that we went through the whole Christmas period being unable to sing any songs. But here we are, and we can. So I thought we'd start off just by rejoicing, and one of the, the tensions at this time of year for, for many ministers is folk want to sing Christmas carols, but we're sort of saying, it's Advent. And Advent isn't just Christmas. Advent is actually thinking about the Lord's coming and the promises that have been made for us as we look forward to his coming again. Um, but I thought I'd find a hymn today that, that really brings both of those together. So I thought we'd start with joy to the world. The Lord has come, is come. So let's listen to these words, or better still, let's sing them. Let's pray together, shall we?
joy to the world. Father, we come at a time where it's sometimes quite difficult to see the joy in the world. As we worry about viruses and returns of viruses, as we look at asylum seekers and displaced people, as we worry about all that is going on that is difficult, both on the big scale and sometimes in our own lives and our own families. The darkness seems all around us. And yet, Lord, we come to worship. We come to worship because we know the deeper secret, the deeper reality revealed in your word, that you are the Alpha and the Omega. You hold everything in your hands. You have plotted out time from the beginning to the end. And at the right time, you sent your Son. The light that shines in the darkness that would never be put out that which brings hope and peace that goes beyond anything we can create in a moment, in a festival, or in a gathering. And we come, Lord, as your people, not just celebrating what you have done in the coming of your Son into the world, in his death and his resurrection, but celebrating and trusting in that promise that you have made, that all things in you will find their completion, that you will dry the tears that you will break the night, that you will bring justice where there is unfairness and hope where there is despair. And so we come and we pray, come, Lord Jesus, throwing ourselves upon you and asking that you would renew our trust and our hope, even in our weakness and our feeling. We pray together the words that the Lord Jesus taught us as we say, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Well, I thought we would read familiar words today, and we're going to read from the first chapter of the Gospel of Luke, and the story of Mary after the angel has appeared to her going and traveling to see her cousin Elizabeth. So I'm going to read from verse 39 of the first chapter. At that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea, where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Mary was filled, sorry, Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. In a loud voice, she exclaimed, Blessed are you among women. And blessed is the child you will bear. But why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord should come to me? As soon as the sound of your greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. Blessed is he, she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promises to her. And Mary said, my soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has made mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. And he has brought down rulers from their thrones, but lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. 
he has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, just as he promised our ancestors. And Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. There is something about Christmas and song, isn't there? Christmas carols and all that goes with it. And as I say, we have that tension between congregations that want to sing Christmas carols. Sometimes they get away with it from about October. Uh, and quite often ministers who, who, who want to wait a bit. And even when we get into that, there's all sorts of tensions as well, isn't there? Should we sing modern ones or old-fashioned ones? And the ones we love, but... By gosh, the first Noel, all 20,000 verses of it can be a bit much. And all of that goes with it. We love, though, that singing. And it's not just the Christmas carols, the Christmas music, the number one hits. Are we listening to Slade or um, Mariah Carey or or whatever it is on the, the, uh, well, I was going to say radio, but that's dating me, isn't it? It's, it's now all on the podcast and everything else. The point is music and song with Christmas just go hand in hand. The interesting thing is that that's true of the Gospels as well. Luke's Gospel in particular has four songs that are in it. We don't have the music, but we've got the lyrics. One of them is the one that we have just read, Mary's Song, which is often called the Magnificat. And it's called the Magnificat because in Latin, the first line of it, which we translate, um, my soul glorifies the Lord, starts magnify or magnificat in Latin. But there's another three songs that are in Luke's gospel. One of them is Zechariah's song, which is, starts blessed, and so it's called the Benedictus. One of it is the, the song of the angels, the shepherds, the Gloria, Gloria in excelsis Deo, we, we know those words. And the other one is Simeon's song when he says, now may your servant depart in peace. So these songs are are, are bound into Scripture itself. And indeed, all of Christian worship should be about the same thing. It's about saying, may the Lord be glorified. May his name be lifted high. May he be magnified and raised up. Worship isn't about us. But it's about him. It is, says scripture, a sacrifice of praise. Uh, sometimes when we're singing a song we hate, sacrifice of praise might seem um, quite apt, mightn't it? But very often the problem with our churches is that it really does become about what I like to sing, what I enjoy that lifts me up. And we forget that it's actually about lifting the Lord up. Um, I, I, I like the fact that psalmist says that um, we should make a joyful noise unto the Lord of the earth. So there's hope for us that can't sing. And there's hope for us that are singing out of key. Or those of us that are singing in key, but maybe just a different key for each bar. There's hope for all of that as we come to sing. And, and, And that song of worship can be anything from the smallest child singing a song of praise to Handel's Messiah. It doesn't matter where it is if it comes from the heart. The song, the Magnificat, has a context. The angel comes to Mary and tells her that she's going to have a baby. And the context of that is that Mary is immediately bemused, isn't she? How can this be? I'm only a virgin. And our minds go to the fullness of what has been laid for Mary in what will come, the the family heartache that this must have been brought, the confusion and misunderstanding, the whispers and the stares that must have come with it, never mind the story that goes on from there as they have to travel all the way in that state to Bethlehem and the squalor of the stable. We often romanticize all of this and we forget just how difficult it was. Matthew's gospel in particular puts all this out, what will happen to Mary. Down to Herod and his soldiers and fleeing as refugees into Egypt. But for a moment, Luke takes us somewhere else. Mary coming to her cousin Elizabeth 
are the two of them for that time caught up, almost giddy, heady, with this sense of what God is doing and their delight and their worship and their joy. This is a baby shower to mark all baby showers. It's a moment of pure praise and delight as they just rejoice in God. The story seems to be a story about Elizabeth. She is there as, as Mary comes, and their relationship we don't quite know. They might well be cousins. Not quite sure. Their age gap we, we don't really know. We guess Elizabeth was a lot older because the Bible says that she was thought to be past childbearing age, but actually if she'd been married 10 years and had no children, that would have been her seen as being beyond childbearing age, although she may only have been in her late 20s or, or 30s. Probably Mary is a good deal younger, a new bride, probably very young, maybe even a teenager, but we are really speculating at all this point. But the two of them are there connecting. And the first thing that we notice, despite whatever relationship they've had in the past, they may well have known one another very well. When Mary enters, Elizabeth's joy is not, oh, it's nice to see you, cousin. It's not, I'm heavily pregnant, here comes someone to help. I know when our relatives knocked the door, when, when we were um, about to have a baby or just had a baby, uh, there were two thoughts that went through our mind. One was, sometimes with some of them, it was really helpful. That's great, there's some extra help. And other times it was, oh no, <laughs> I've got to cater for them too. But I don't know about that. But the joy actually isn't in any of that. The joy is in what God is doing. Mary comes in and before she has said anything, Elizabeth is greeting her with how blessed you are and how blessed I am that you have come. Notice in this, though, Elizabeth's humility. Elizabeth has been chosen to be the mother of a prophet. Elizabeth is already the wife of an important priest. She's someone with some standing in the community. And yet when Mary comes in, and she knows that Mary has been chosen to bring birth to the Lord himself, her immediate thought is how blessed you are and how happy that makes me. We were saying a few weeks ago that when we see other people being blessed and, 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 and lifted up, sometimes that's not our response at all, is it? Our response is a bit of jealousy. I've only got a prophet. You've got a Messiah. Oh, I'm supposed to be more important than you. I'm older. I'm the big cousin. And I'm the priest's wife. I thought, I, you know, I, I, who are you? But there's none of that. There's just a real joy. Blessed are you, Mary, among all women. And blessed I am that you have come. Who am I that you should come to see me? You know, this is, this is very important in our Christian living. That we have a sense of humility. A sense of humility that always marvels at what God has given us. Is always grateful. Is always aware that we did not deserve whatever joy, whatever blessing, whatever gift that we see. And particularly when we see God on the move, answering prayers as they did at that moment, we are filled not with a sense of, oh, we're obviously doing things right in this church if that happens. The church down the road isn't doing that. But we're filled with a sense of awe. And moreover, when we are seeing other churches or other people blessed by God and God moving in their lives, we are not left thinking, oh, why didn't he do that for me? We're left thinking, I am so happy for what God is doing for you. Very often that is not the case. And then the second part of humility is this. It's Mary herself. As Mary sings this song, she says, For he has been mindful of the humble state of his servants. All generations will call me blessed because the mighty one has done great things for me. Holy is his name. Mary says, I am humble. Now, 
if we just read that at face value, there might seem a bit of an irony, isn't there? I, I used to have a badge that someone gave me which said, I used to be conceited, but now I'm perfect. You know, the person who comes around and says, oh, I am humble, is actually full of themselves, aren't they? And in fact, sometimes folk protest to humility in churches. I get so frustrated with people in churches who say things like, well, it, it, you know, um, I, I, I could And they think it, it's, a, it's a humility, it's, it's a self-effacing. But actually what you're saying is, the gifts God's given me are rubbish. That's not humility. Mary says, though, the humble state of his servant. So what's going on here? Well, actually, the interesting thing is that the word Mary uses isn't about a mental disposition. It's not about a feeling of inadequacy. That's what we usually mean by humility. Rather, it's actually about a social state. The word in Greek is tapainoi, and, and what it literally means is the nobody that I am. And when she uses that term, she is, she is using it to say, effectively, I am a social nobody. I'm at the bottom of the heap. I'm, well, I suppose in, in, in our language we would say, I'm at the bottom of the working class. The tapainoi was an expression that was used for the peasants, for the nothing. And it wasn't to say, oh, they're people with a great humility in their heart. It was to say there are people that have barely got a shirt on their back. I'm a nobody. And this song that she goes on to say, it isn't saying, oh, I'm, I'm humble, look at me. Rather, it's saying this, you are amazing. Because you keep your promises, Lord. You lift up the folk at the bottom of the heap, like me. And therefore, I can believe your promises. For Israel, which is at the moment the most despised and rejected and persecuted of nations, I can believe your promises that you're going to bring down the kings from their thrones and lift up the humble. But that, again, she doesn't mean those who feel that they're nothing. She means those that are nothing. The interesting thing in this song that is recorded by Luke is that Luke, as he writes this gospel, is very much aware that the world is full of big people. He addresses the whole gospel to a guy called Theophilus, the most excellent Theophilus. Now, we don't really know who Theophilus was, but he may well have been an important person in the Roman administration. So, Luke is very much aware that there are big, important people in the world. And in fact, as you read Luke's gospel and his account of the Christmas story, chapter 2, verse 1, in the days of Caesar Augustus, now you don't get any bigger than the emperor. And in fact, Caesar Augustus isn't, isn't just an emperor, he was the most important. Those that know a little bit of Roman history will know he used to be called Octavian. He was the nephew of Julius Caesar, and he had risen to become the first Roman emperor. It wasn't just that he was king, he had defeated all his enemies in a massive civil war. He was being portrayed all over the Roman world as the one who had brought peace and prosperity. He was to reign for decades. In fact, he was the first emperor who people started to worship. Not because they were afraid, but in the east, because they were aware of this man had done so much for them. They built temples in his honor. They renamed cities for him. He's a big guy. And in the gospel story, he is also a big guy because he gives this decree, doesn't he? That all the world shall be taxed. And he doesn't realize, he doesn't think about the tapainoi, the little people, the nobodies that are going to be moved around by this. And among them, a peasant girl that he would never hear of, and her fiancé. And that is the way the world is, isn't it? Big people make big decisions. Little people just get swept along. Except that's not the way of the gospel. Because Luke would be aware, as Mary is in her song, that actually all lives are in God's hands. Caesar Augustus might think that he's making these big decisions that shape the world. Actually, he's been manipulated and used by a God who controls all things, who wants Mary to go to Bethlehem 
because he's foretold that his son will be born in the city of David to fulfill the ancient promises that came 500 years before Caesar Augustus was ever heard of and will shape the world among people who will never hear of Caesar Augustus. Magnify the Lord, Mary begins. Magnify the Lord. The irony is, of course, that what the church has often done is magnified Mary. Verse 45, Elizabeth said, Blessed is he, she who has believed in the Lord, and he, that he would fulfill his promises to her. And the church has looked at that and said, well, look at the example of Mary's faith. And yes, Luke does show us Mary's faith and her willingness, let it be to me according to your word. But we have, over our centuries, taken that so far that Mary has been lifted up until she is almost a divine figure. We even have a church in Motherwell named for her, don't we? Just as this one's named for St. Andrews on his day. But that whole idea, and particularly in Roman Catholicism, where Mary becomes so, so important, a paragon of faith. Indeed, the church got to the point of saying she must be sinless. The Bible doesn't say that at all. But as we read Mary's song, what it invites us to do, as we should do for all Christians, is to realize that she is not special. But the scripture at one level tells us if we feel that we are nothing, we are tapainoi, then God raises us up. But in another sense, no matter how much you're raised up, it's God that receives all the glory and the praise. It's interesting in Luke's gospel, there is a point where Jesus is doing things in Luke 11, and a man says to Jesus, blessed is the woman who bore you. Jesus says, don't say that. Rather say, blessed are those who hear and obey my word. And there's another point where Jesus' mother and brothers, and, and Luke is quite blunt about this, they, they think he's off his head. And they go to bring him home. And the disciples go in and they say, Jesus, your mum and your brothers are, 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 are at the door. You know, they should get special treatment. And Jesus says, my mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and obey. Now, those are very hard things to say, but they are a reminder that Luke is not suggesting, that Luke is not suggesting that we put people on pedestals. And this is very important for the church as well. Sometimes we're inclined to... to, to put people on pedestals. We're inclined to look at some big Christians and think, well, they must be important. They must shape us. They must influence us. Um, for all of us who are, are in any form of ministry, there is always that danger. There's some people who think ministers are complete irrelevance and we just give them whatever cheat we want. And there's other people who, who think the minister said. I, I was aware of going in to see a lady a number of years ago and she's telling me about what her doctor had prescribed and asking my opinion, I suddenly had this horrible realization that if I had said, oh, I don't know if the doctor's right, she'd have said, oh, that's fine then. I don't know anything about medicine. We need that great humility. For, for one thing, it, it, it is necessary because sometimes those that are in leadership in the church will bitterly disappoint us. And if we have raised them up and put our faith in, in them, we will be utterly crushed. But if in our faith we put in the living God who sends his son and we are aware of both that we are broken and sinful, but also that those that we admire within the church are also broken and sinful, then we will not be shaken, but we will give glory to God. Now, all of this is in a context. For this context is also about John the Baptist. When he was prophesied it was said that before his birth, he would be filled with the Holy Spirit. And when he was older and he met Jesus by the Jordan, he said, I must decrease that he might increase. And here he is before he's born, jumping for joy. I love the story. Mary wanders into the house, says, Elizabeth, before Elizabeth recognizes her voice, she gets a kick in the diaphragm. Of John saying, it's him. 
Even before he's able to speak, John is pointing to Jesus. And that is what our worship must always do. Look for and point to Jesus Christ, in whom God is changing the world. So when someone starts to tell us a story of what God is doing, we rejoice because God is doing that. And when God starts to do something in our lives, we rejoice because God is doing that. It's not about us. It's always about Him who comes to change the world, who comes to offer Himself to us and for us. To His name be the glory. Amen. Let's pray. Oh, Father, as we look forward to Christmas, there are things that we can't wait for. Gathering, food, song. But as much as we look forward to these things, Lord, we know that they do not satisfy. And so often Christmas can leave us with that sense of disappointment. Help us, Lord, today to see beyond that to the truth of the one that comes in the name of the Lord who changes all things and brings hope. Oh Lord, we rejoice in your faithfulness. We rejoice in what you are doing among your people, even now in our desperation. We pray that you would raise your people up once again, that you would strengthen and renew your church. Lord, as we look around the church in the world today and we are aware of the church that is growing in strength in so many places, we ask, Lord, we wouldn't be jealous as we look at our weakness, but we would rejoice in your strength. and Pray knowing that you can do that among us too. Oh, Lord, give us life, worship, and desires, and all we do as a church, not to satisfy and comfort ourselves, but to point to Jesus who gave his life for us that we might have hope and joy and peace. Amen. I thought we'd close by singing Tell Out My Soul, which is the paraphrase of Mary's words in this passage. So you can stand if you wish. Let's go in hope, let's go in joy, for the Lord has come and he will come again.
And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you all this Advent season and forever. Amen. And there is, I believe, a cup of tea in the hall next door.